just a quick start off with uh, an agenda. So an introduction, I'd like to introduce myself and uh, I'd like to introduce my fellow ISOC staff that are on the call. So uh, if I could just start off maybe with Andrew, the big muscles here. So if Andrew, if you'd like to take the floor and just say hi. Hello, everyone. I don't know that I qualify as the big muscle, but maybe some other. But anyway, it's very nice to be here. I look forward to this today. Great. Ryan? Hi, everybody. Ryan Polk, Director of Internet Policy at the Internet Society based in Virginia in the United States. Uh, really happy to be here and to meet you all. Next, uh, Natalie? Hi, everyone. I'm Natalie. I'm Senior Director of North American Government and Regulatory Affairs. I've had the pleasure of working with many of you here this year, and I'm really excited to hear updates on the amazing success that you've brought in helping us get to our mission. Dan? Hi, Dan York, Director of Internet Technology. I'm based up in Vermont, and I'm excited to listen to all the things that you're doing here. I'm the project leader this year of our Sustainable Technical Communities Grant program, which had spon event sponsorships that I think uh, many of you may have applied for, or some of you did. And uh, if you haven't applied for them, they're available next year through the Internet Society Foundation, and I would encourage you to think about uh, looking at that. John, please. Hi, John Morris. I joined about a year and a half ago to ISOC after spending 20, 30 years doing internet policy in Washington, D.C., where I am still. So let's, without further ado, is Franca. Franca, are you here yet? Good morning, fellow North American chapter leaders. My name is Franca Palazzo. I act as executive director for the Internet Society Canada chapter. And I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, share my experience with you. I know all of you have dedicated your time and are passionate about the internet and keeping it safe and functioning. Uh, and I think we all have different approaches when, when it comes to um, our work. Uh, I think we're all in the same boat. We have limited resources. Uh, many of you are volunteers. I'm fortunate enough to uh, be able to be compensated when we're doing well, and uh, I'm very thankful for that. But when we're not, I volunteer. So uh, for me, it's a vocation. <laughs> but so I think, as I said earlier, we all have different focuses based on the region we're working out of and uh, the expertise we have uh, in our volunteers. And I don't think I have anything to share that uh, you don't already know, but I'm happy to, to share what we are doing uh, at the Canada chapter, where our focus is and what's worked for us, and also some of the areas that we can Im improve upon. And there are many, again, due to lack of resources and, and expertise. So we've been very intentional about who we recruit to our board. And I think that's important. You, you really do need board members who are not only passionate about the mission, but also who have something to bring to the table and the time to, to dedicate to it. We've been really fortunate in our board members. We have former public servants who actually help to write some of the current broadcasting telecoms acts and lawyers who are working in the space, former competition bureau chair, former CRTC commissioners, all who put pen to paper. So for us, the focus has been advocacy with respect to legislation and regulation. A lot of you I know are, are working more in a practical technical space in terms of actual projects that are bringing internet to, to communities, et cetera. But for us, uh, we take a, a more regulatory approach. A lot of our work focuses around educating the public servants who are actually writing the legislations or regulations that the government wants put forward. Uh, I have to be honest, it's been like banging our head against the wall for the past few years because this government is, let's just say, has good intentions, but is not going about it the right way. Uh, one of the ways that we approach, first of all, developing a position on proposed legislation and regulation, and then 
crafting a response to that is we have put together an amazing policy committee. So in addition to a great board, we have thought leaders and expertise on our policy committee where these proposed legislations, regulations are put forward, they are discussed, and a position is agreed upon, and then people put pen to paper, and we put together our submissions. If anyone's interested, internetsociety.ca, under publications, you can find some of our papers that we've put forward and published. We have been able to create enough of a, an awareness about uh, our chapter that we are called on to appear before parliamentary committees, Senate committees, to provide our position and our uh, input. So that's been helpful. However, I can't say we've been very successful in actually getting them to change, alter perhaps, but fundamentally they haven't gone in the direction we want them to on anything yet. But the, the fight continues. What we did in the last year or two, actually two years now, is we've been able to attract corporate membership. That has brought an important perspective to our policy committee and our policy creation. It's important to know where private sector is, you know, their concerns. And we believe in a multi-stakeholder approach. And so it's really helpful to have those voices on our policy committee. Currently, we have Google, Texera, and Deloitte as corporate members. Another area that we're pretty active is in the events that we put on. These events, again, are mainly for the purpose of educating public servants who are creating legislation. So we're not looking to put on events for, you know, 200, 300 people. We're looking for small groups of thought leaders and people who are actually influencing policy. That in and of itself attracts the private sector who also want to get their message across. We're not pay for play. We won't put on an event with a perspective that goes against our fundamental beliefs and our mission. So they have to be in alignment, but currently based on what's going on, we just happen to be aligned with many of the big tech. So we've been able to attract them in putting on events because as you know, to put on an event takes money, and so, uh, again, we've been really fortunate. Amazon Web Services is not a corporate member just because of the way their, their budgets are set up, but they've been huge supporters through sponsoring events. What else can I tell you? Well, one area that we could improve upon is our correspondence with our members just the average member who has not necessarily decided to join policy committee or an area where, where they can be active. But uh, that is something we'd like to do. So put together some sort of newsletter. I think that would be helpful. We've kind of come to a, a point where we've realized that individual members, like the average Canadian, because of the nature of our work, isn't really necessarily aware of us, or even if they were, would understand what we do. So we've kind of shifted our focus on attracting the corporate membership because these people have a vested interest in the internet working well. So all this to say, to become a member of our chapter, there is a membership fee. Once, once an individual goes to ISOC Global, says they want to become a member, and then chooses their region... They can only become a member of the Canada chapter if they then go through our membership process and pay the fee to become a member. Um, I think that's about it. Social media has been a challenge. The platforms that work best for us are, I guess, X now, but mostly I would say LinkedIn. LinkedIn is where our network lies. What else can I tell you? Uh, I think that's about it. Just to recap, find out 
who cares about what you're doing? Oh, the other thing I'd like to say is I, I really appreciate that ISOC Global is making funds more and more accessible now. It's easier to get funding from the foundation for small grants. And that's been helpful as well. As you all know, we don't have uh, a lot of resources. So that's really helping us with our mission and putting on activities where we can raise our profile and get to the people that we need to get to, to, to influence decisions in, in the right direction. I, I hope this has been helpful. I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing what the rest of you are doing. And if, if anyone ever wants to reach out to me for anything, I don't know, advice or, or assistance, we'd be happy to help. You can just message me at franca at internetsociety.ca. Okay, thanks so much. And I hope you all have a great day. Jessica, you are second in line with the SFA chapter. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. Here's our quick year in review for our chapter. So our major five projects were the chapter seating committee, the Beyond the Net Grant Large, Beyond the Net Grant Small, Global Encryption Day, and Advocacy and Education. Here's a picture uh, from our Global Encryption Day event with, I'll get a little bit more into that later. So we had the chapter seating committee, also called the chapter planting committee. I realized everybody was pretty confused by the title, so I'm considering renaming it seating committee. We supported a number of chapters that are reaching the official formation stage with ISOC. Um, right now, the Pacific Northwest chapter is, I believe, in formal chapter information status. And I know the SoCal chapter just got their 501c3 paperwork in. So fingers crossed, they'll enter the formal process with you all in the next couple of weeks. And then we have also been supporting folks in Alaska, Nevada, and Utah in starting additional chapters in the United States. Taking a little bit of a step back, this was a project that was my big project for my last year on the board, because um, we're allowed to have two two-year cycles. And I wanted there to be more chapters for ISOC in the United States, a little bit because I've done um, some policy work in both the state level and the federal level. And I wanted there to be more senators who had a chapter in their backyard who could poke them about what they were talking about. Because I think a little bit, just having a couple of us out there, we can be as loud as we want, but it's better when there are, you know, a lot of senators, a lot of House representatives who have locals who can speak their language. So we not only provided monthly hour-long support meetings for peers seeking to create these chapters, as well as doing recruiting from our own network as a chapter to gather in these different chapter leaders, as well, um, oh, that should say a thousand. Our chapter kicked in a thousand dollars to three different chapters to help pay 501c3 fees. And that has helped them move forward because it costs about $770 to do all your filing to become your own separately incorporated nonprofit. What's next year? We'll continue meeting monthly throughout 2024, and we're focusing on Arizona and Texas. So if any of you are in Arizona or Texas or have friends or family members there who want to be founding members of an ISOC committee, let us know. And we'll invite them to the calls. They're very friendly, very practical. We go over like, how do you fill out a 501c3 application form? What grants are available to you? How cool is Natalie to work with on policy? You know, just the usual stuff. We also had two Beyond the Net grants that we are continuing through from last year and then one that we started this year. There's Beyond the Net Grant Large, which has to do with the internet needs of underserved Latine folks on the Central Coast, like Half Moon Bay, for those of you familiar with the Bay Area. We have a survey being distributed about what their current internet needs are in Spanish as well as in English. There's regularly formed meetings of a committee that involves local elections electeds, as well as our partners at ALAS, which is the implementation organization. And then we've also supported stuff like iPads and mobile hotspots to actually allow them to gather the data. What's next? Collecting and finalizing survey results, and then making recommendations to key policymakers to see if we can make the internet connectivity more what the people impacted by it want and need in that area. We're also hoping that this might be a model for other communities with large farm worker populations. A lot of my friends in West Africa have similar dynamics that we have here. So I'm, I hope that might be useful to other chapters. This is one of my favorite visuals from that particular partner organization. This is their equity bus. It was donated by Genentech and painted as part of their community work. And it is just, you know, if social services came in a bus like this, I think a lot more people would participate. I think it's very charming. 
We also have a Beyond the Net grant small at $5,000 um, that is providing free digital equity skills training to key stakeholders that might be folks working in private spaces, that might be folks working in um, civic spaces. The group is called LA Tech for Good. They're also some of the folks who are putting a lot of energy behind the new LA SoCal chapter that is hopefully entering the formation stage pretty soon. They'll be completing the training in early 2024 submitting the grant report, and then we'll be done. The nice thing about the small grants is it's a pretty tight cycle on those. We also had Global Encryption Day, which we were very excited to get a $1,000 grant for. We hosted a seven-hour event, handed out hundreds of stickers. I didn't expect to send out so many, but it turned out it was on Oktoberfest. So there were tons of people walking by who tipsily were delighted to have a I heart encryption pinky tattoos handed out to them. I ended up with almost none of those left. I ended up with a lot of end-to-end -end encryption saves lives because I ordered approximately 2,000. There's only so much I can hand out myself. But we had grant money left over because I didn't buy snacks. And so we paid the international shipping to send it to about a dozen project partners through the Global Encryption Coalition throughout West Africa and India. And a couple of folks in Canada asked for them too. So all the leftovers went to people who wanted and needed them and hopefully were able to use them. And they don't have to live in my garage, which is a, a key goal of mine as a community organizer. We had a lot of good conversations. One of the big things we were working on is this, which I'll show a copy of in a couple of moments, which was an alpha version of a book called Encryption for Babies that I just got up on Amazon's self-publishing tool last night. It should be available for purchase. It's under Creative Commons non-commercial, so anybody is welcome to remix it as they would like. And it just goes through and explains what encryption is for a little person. After a good conversation with Natalie, I'm hoping to continue working on those and write some that are like manners for babies or the um, internet way of working for babies. Not necessarily that babies need these things, but as Natalie gently pointed out, maybe it'd start a good conversation with some of those key policy stakeholders if we gave them something appropriate for their grandchildren or children. Not all people in the Senate are octogenarians. So yeah, so that's online. And then we did policy advocacy and education. We wrote to key members of the California Assembly and State Senate about the, I don't remember the title, but it was the bill that said it was for journalism that sort of mimics what's been happening in Canada and Australia, but that is perhaps not as wisely conceived as it could have been. So we shared ISOC's language and letters with them. We signed on to the group letter about IGF reconsidering their location. Um, and then we've engaged in a lot of different online conversations within the ISOC community, specifically around internet as a weapon of war, that kind of thing. Um, Non-project work, we've provided our 1,100 members a monthly newsletter. We ran a nomcom process that's ending today. If you're one of our members, please vote. Last year, we onboarded five new board members. We didn't end up managing to get the admin grant because I goofed on the date, but that's one of the reasons I wrote the book is to hopefully give us a funding stream in addition to the admin grant. We maintained our gigabit status. We presented on some chapter work as an aside to an event in San Diego, and then lots of community work. One of the ones I'm most proud of, and thank you to Kyle for this, is getting to support the youth SIG in some of their fundraising work. So that was really fun to get to talk to so many cool young people about how to get themselves to IGF. And that is it. That's mostly what we did. If you will forgive a walk through my house, I was running late because my toddler fell asleep in the car, but I can show you a copy of Encryption for Babies, and then I will let you all go. So here's encryption for baby and it starts out, this is an idea and then this is your idea and it has a little mirror that I stuck in myself. So the version on Amazon won't have a little mirror, but you can stick one in yourself. And it just goes through not only what encryption is, but what encryption isn't. It talks about some things are called encryption, but if they allow people to give away your keys, encryption can't keep its promise. So for those of us who are big encryption nerds, I think you might enjoy the book a little bit there. But yeah, that's what our chapter has been working on. We have a really great board. I'm coming off of it this year, but you'll have a lot of folks you've worked with before. And yeah, I'm just really excited to see what they do next year. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, Jessica. This is amazing. And congratulations to the San Francisco Bay chapter. Great work. Thank you so much. Awesome. So next up is Joel in the Manitoba chapter. So please, Joel, welcome. Just really brief. 
the Internet Society Managed Chapter is a couple of years old now, and we're trucking along now at full speed. We're pretty happy. We've got a couple of small projects, and that's what I'm going to highlight now. One of three chapters now in Canada, and hoping to support some more if we can, but right now that's where we're at. Two big projects that we're doing. This was the first one and definitely our biggest or most effortful. It's called the North End Connect. It is a community network that we're establishing in the north end of Winnipeg, which is a low neighborhood that you may or may not be familiar with, but it's probably, it is the largest population of Indigenous people in Canada off reserve. It's also home to a large number of newcomers. So it has a lot of, uh, a lot of issues, uh, but it has a really great community presence, a lot of great nonprofits and social organizations working in the neighborhood. And the one thing that they had absolutely no role in and needed help with was in connectivity. So we started a project a couple of years ago with a research phase and then moved into building an actual network. Originally, it was conceived in a perfect world that it was going to be a nice, clean research phase, and that was going to then cleanly hand over to a kind of build and operations phase, uh, and real life got in the way. Anybody who knows community-based participatory action research is messy and uh, awesome, but it is definitely not following any perceived timelines that we had. So the research is technically complete, but we haven't completed everything. Uh, we're still writing the final paper now to be submitted, so... It's still a work in progress, uh, but it accomplished its mission. It did give us an amazing insight into the community and what the obstacles were and exactly what that meant. And it also gave us a really good idea of what we had for positive things at our disposal that we could work with. These are some photos of the, the research team. We were in Thunder Bay last year in June, presented at an academic conference for community-based research. Uh, and that went really well. It was very well received. The main findings, I think, from the research were things that you wouldn't necessarily think of. We all know that income and education are large factors in predicting if people have connectivity. But in this particular neighborhood, we really drilled down into the nuances that came with income. And it was more about instability of income. It wasn't about having or not having a lot of money. It was that you don't have it consistently. People who get into bad credit situations, not having simple things like identification to enter into contracts or not owning the property. If you're staying with someone or with friends or couch surfing or anything like that, you can't even get the contract. So it's not necessarily about having the, the, the money or not. It's about more complicated financial things. That was one aspect of it. There's also a lot of transitory nature. People move around a lot and the neighborhood itself doesn't have a lot of access points. There's not a lot of businesses in the neighborhood. Uh, there's no banks in the neighborhood, things like that. So there's a lot of commercial solutions that would be available in other places that aren't in this neighborhood. So those are a lot of the things we learned from the research. All of that is going into and informing the way that we support and design the network itself. The first thing that we started with in parallel with the research as well is a computer giveaway. We have an organization uh, called Computers for Schools in Manitoba. It's part of a national distribution system that the federal government exhausts their computers into and lots of large businesses give their computers into the system and the interns refurbish the computers and we are one of the recipients of those computers. They don't have a neighborhood front end capability, so we act as that liaison. We partner with groups in the North End to get the computers into people's hands and we get them for free from the Computers for Schools organization. I think we just broke 300 of the PCs going home and then we also have labs that we've established for digital literacy classes and things like that. So lots of hardware going into the field at no cost to the participants. We also established this probably in August and September of this year. So it's been going for a few months now, digital skills training in partnership with the local library, which has actually been good. They've reported back to us that they've actually had more people coming to the library to use the library services because they've either come to one of our digital skill classes, or it's also a pickup point for computers. If people don't want them delivered. They want to pick them up. They go to the library and pick up the computers there, and then they realize, hey, there's a library here, and then they start using it. So they're actually getting an increase in their usage as well. So it's been a really great relationship. And we have um, classes going on with other organizations around the neighborhood as well. 
Uh, and then the last thing, which is kind of backwards, we did the whole thing kind of in reverse, is that we're working on the mesh uh, network distribution that's still in its infancy. We're in a pilot phase right now. We have servers installed. We have two, two places right now that have antennas uh, connecting them together, and we're expanding out there. We'll have access point configuration for locations uh, like community centers and things like that we're partnered with and then uh, direct to homes for local residents as well. We do have a third format, I guess, in multi-unit dwellings, apartment blocks, and we're still working on that as well. So we have three modes that the network will operate in, or at least that's what we're working on right now. So that's developing. It's been very positive and going really well, but it has been slower than expected. So that's kind of our urban strategy that is taking a lot from other projects that are going on around North America and around the world that are community networks, but that's in an urban setting. For the rest of Manitoba, for the rest of the province, we've just started a project with the University of Brandon. They have a rural development institute. It's a unit inside the university that's got academics uh, in it who are focused on uh, community development in rural Manitoba. They're a perfect match for us. There's an organization called MyTax. There's a link at the bottom there. Uh, in Canada, it is Canadian, but there are opportunities for international um, connections. I don't know much about that, but uh, you may want to look into it. Uh, what happens is a uh, organization funds a portion, a very small portion, in this case, $7,500 which was our contribution and then my tax kicks in all of the rest of the funding and it's covering for us right now two undergrad students who will be dedicated part-time for the next six months and then full-time over the summer to work on this project with us so my tax is an amazing funding stream if you are interested in this kind of a thing what we're looking at is digital initiatives in rural manitoba what is working, what is not working in the past, what kind of activity projects have worked, which ones have worked and then failed, which ones failed right out, an idea of what kind of funding is coming from the federal government uh, into Manitoba. The one thing that's novel about this project that we're trying to do, and it's new, at least in the academic world, is that this will be resulting in a podcast series. Instead of doing the research and then just doing knowledge mobilization about the project after the research is done, the intent right now is to use the podcast series as method. So if any researchers out there, we want to simultaneously be conducting the podcast interviews and using that as part of the research itself. We know the first couple of podcast content, the episodes, we know what we want to do, but we don't know what the last kind of six or seven are going to be because the intent is that as the first ones go out, we will have people contact us and we'll be reaching out farther with those first episodes, which will drive the research agenda from the second part. So it's definitely a different approach when it comes to the way that academic research is usually done, but we think that it's going to be much more interactive and give us a better result. So we're kind of pushing the envelope on the connectivity side and on the academic side. Those are big projects. We've got lots going on, but in general, those are the ones that we're most busy with and they're going really well. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Joel. I really appreciate it. And uh, congratulations there. I posted the North End Connect video into the chat. So if anyone wants to take a look at that, it's beautifully done and it's a, a great piece. So that was part of your BNET project for this year, correct? Yes. Yeah, that was uh, ISOC Foundation funded and a local Indigenous filmmaker uh, was brought in to do it and handed over to them. I think they told a really great story and we hope to have an updated version soon with more actually getting done. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you, Joel, and thank you, the Manitoba chapter. Next up, we have the New York chapter and Stuart Reed. Please, Stuart, welcome. Thank you for this opportunity to, to talk about uh, the work of Einstein New York. I, I apologize. I just got drafted yesterday into this presentation. Our, our president, Greg Shatton, wasn't able to make it today. So I don't have a fancy PowerPoint to share. But I will talk about some of the work that we have done. I've got a little bit of a laundry list of stuff. The, the, the big thing with us is we finally had our election, which was a little bit of uh, torture over the last year or so, pulling it together. And we elected a new board of directors and several new officers. We're, we're really excited. We got some fresh blood in. Holly Spain, Phil Davis, Doug Frazier, Danny Glitz, Naeem Gorey, Jenny Bourne, and Dawn A.C. Rodriguez are all 
new board members coming on the board. Uh, returning officers include Greg Shatton, myself, Secretary Joseph Friedman, and we're all kind of very excited about uh, getting into the new year with a new team on board. One of the big things that we did do this past year, thanks in large part to Jolie McPhee, is I saw it, New York TV live stream and webcast a number of activities around the city, including a Wikipedia Day, a New York City Outreach and Educational Panel, Achieving Digital Equity, Filling in the Adoption Gaps. This was a panel discussion back in March. Uh, Naralo ISOC New York sponsored a Universal Acceptance Day event. All these events were live streamed and are still available for viewing uh, via our, our website. Creating uh, accessible iOS apps and action plan live stream April 20th. Besides New York City Conference on Information and Security live stream April 22nd. New York City Mesh Meetup June 7th. We did a New York City Internet and Digital Listening Session with the Empire State Connect All Office. This is a New York State sponsored uh, program where New York State officials went around uh, the state listening to folks' needs to help bridge the digital divide. That was something that we helped host the event for New York City and live streamed it. Broadband Freedom of Choice Virtual Town Hall, September 6th. And then this is the event that I was uh, closely associated with on September 28th. I saw New York underwrote and live stream the annual Harlan Emergency Preparedness Day event from City College of New York, as it did in 2019 and a couple of years prior as well, prior to the pandemic. As you may know, September is a National Emergency Preparedness Day event, and it's a big deal here in New York City. And this event was live streamed. Presenters included the Harlem Hospital, New York City Fire Department, Red Cross, New York City Emergency Management, We Act Environmental Justice folks, and others. The event was a rousing success, and I want to thank uh, Jolie for his impeccable live stream production services that helped make this uh, a reality. We also had a community partner, 2023 New York Metro Joint Cybersecurity Conference and Workshop, October 19th and 20th. And then on November 15th, Columbia Institute for Teleinformation held a session on U.S. reversal on digital trade policy, implications for digital governance. And then finally, I guess just yesterday, we had a Naralo Post Icon 78 readout session moderated by Greg Shatton, the Naralo Chair and ISOC New York President. That was live streamed as well. And then I just wanted to mention some of the programmatic things that we have done. In 2020, ISOC New York, working in partnership with Digital Divide Partners, received a Beyond the, uh, the Net large grant to implement a streaming station community news project was highlighted in, in an ISOC Foundation feature story. And the reason I'm talking about it is the activities have continued. Thanks to the grant that was uh, awarded in 2020, um, we created a whole infrastructure where public housing and residents are able to live stream uh, programming. We created a mobile radio communications program that focused on healthcare, education, food, and resource coordination. That infrastructure and the resident training uh, that the, was, we were able to do under that project uh, has enabled New York City housing residents to continue the live streaming activity. We have ongoing programs that are archived on our Streaming University YouTube channel. Uh, one program called the Wisdom Table, where we have seniors talk about issues of concern to them, as well as bring in experts from outside to talk about issues from family care, health care, legal issues, and on. Black Doctors on COVID, this was a big deal during COVID and still today, where the Black community in particular was really skeptical of a lot of information that was being put out there. And we were able to corral a number of MDs, physicians, and scientists that talked about COVID as it related to the Black community. So we did a whole series of Black Doctors on COVID. What's in Your Hand is a motivational series. And the other community-based programming that continue to be archived on our channel, thanks to the grant that was awarded by the foundation back in 2020. Today, we still continue the community mobile radio programs program, which includes daily reports 
on building safety conditions, including elevator heat, hot water status for over 35 high rise buildings in Harlem and Brooklyn. The New York City housing uh, community is a huge community, uh, nearly half a million people, community the size of uh, the city of Boston or Atlanta. And most of the buildings are high rise elevator buildings, several thousand elevators and the issues on a daily basis with elevators working or not working, heat and hot water. So this radio program, mobile radio walkie-talkie program that we established with the help of the ISAC Foundation grant enables residents to take control of their own safety and in their own community, where they report to each other, keep a log, keep track of what's going on, and they're able to monitor and really kind of take control of their own safety and quality of life. The most recent thing, ISAC New York collaborated with the Smart Community Initiative, TSEI, a local nonprofit and public housing residents to create a community-based live streaming service called DDP Free TV that includes real-time messaging, notifications, video streaming content, all available on lobbies in public housing buildings, as well as on an application that we developed that residents have access to on their mobile and connected devices. So this is a live stream, real time from lobby in one of the developments in East Harlem. We have inserts here with, this is the New York City Council hearing. We are able to post calls and other announcements. All of this information is programmed and controlled by the residents themselves. So again, this is a way for them and us together to really take control of what's going on in the in their community. This is the development in Brooklyn. And the folks, again, are able to monitor what's going on in their buildings. This is another development in Brooklyn where you can see the actual screen in the lobby that folks, when they come in, they're able to see themselves as well as all the announcements and activities that are programmed by the resident leadership. So we've got about a couple dozen channels so far, and uh, we're looking to expand it. We're in uh, three developments in East Harlem and North Harlem and Brooklyn. And Internet Society has been really helpful in collaborating with the local nonprofit to make all of this happen. So we're really excited just to be able to have our feet on the ground and actually provide real-time services that help improve the quality of life for residents in, as I said, a very huge community in New York City. Half a million folks underserved, and just, you know, FYI, something like 40 to 50 percent of the folks in public housing still don't have connectivity, even though the city has initiated a, a big program, a kudos to them for that, but there's still so much work to be done. Uh, but the TSEI and the Internet Society has focused on providing applications and services. Uh, one of the things that, that I've learned in my work over the last couple of decades in working with underserved, under-resourced, low-income folks is that you really have to kind of put the applications and services in their hands. How is this a value to me? How is this going to service me? What's the value proposition for me? So that's why we've been able to develop these applications and services that have real import and meaning for the residents themselves. You're not just talking about connectivity, you're talking about quality and safety in their community. So I'm really happy about that. And I'm really thankful to the Internet Society for their support in collaborating with the folks on the ground here in New York City. Thank you That's very much for that. I uh, appreciate that. And it's really important work that you all are, are doing in, in New York. And uh, yeah, so congratulations there. Thank uh, you. And uh, to the continued success there. It seems like you guys are always busy, never sleeps, and always something going on. So, so I'm very impressed. Next on our agenda is the ISAC Quebec chapter. Pierre Jean, are you here? Welcome. Hi, everyone. I'll, I'll be a bit brief. I'm, I'm the last minute addition to the speaker on, on this call. But uh, with the ISO Quebec chapters, so we continued our work on discoverability of uh, French speaking content online, diversity and visibility. We were part of two big projects, let's say it like that. One that is done through a, a grant from the Heritage Canada, Federal Ministry in Canada, 
about discoverability, visibility, and diversity of content. Basically, the idea is to study and understand causes and effects of the lack of exposure of, of Canadians to diversified online content, more specifically within the French-speaking context. There is also a pan-Canadian uh, comparison with the English-speaking uh, content too. The, the project is still ongoing and will be published early next year, uh, both available, of course, in French and English, as we're a bilingual country. Last year, we also published a study with the Privacy Commissioner of Canada for another uh, project, another grant, uh, based on algorithm. This project was a study on perceptions and uh, assessment of maturity and confidence level of Canadian users uh, about streaming services in relation to the use of data within algorithm by big companies. So how the, the data is kept, how it is used, and mostly how it is used with artificial intelligence to be combined with an algorithm and create personalized content for users. This was the first study published and the Privacy Commissioner did a rebound a couple of months ago. So there will be a follow-up in the coming year on this specific topic where we'll do more in-depth study and the more uh, on-the-ground study, let's say it like that. That is a pan-Canadian project. So as we're in, in Quebec, there is always a French-speaking part, but we always tend to figure out how it works outside also to have a comparison at the country level. Other couple of projects this year were more focused on the policies, regulations in terms of uh, inclusion, digital rights. We are developing a series with a partner, Lab Delta, at University of Montreal to have a speaker series about, let's say, every two months. We already had a couple ones this year more focused on digital divide and how to, to figure this out and how to fill the gap specifically within the Quebec and Canadian context again. And also a couple events based on universal acceptance, so a bit more perhaps technical, technical on this one, more related with ICANN projects than, than ISOC, but we feel the mix is still important, so that's why we would need a couple stuff in terms of acceptance and access. I know there is a discussion in terms of access and accessibility. So I'll use the term access here and not accessibility. And final project I would mention would be our IGF Quebec that we had last October. So we had it back to back, the Quebec IGF and the Canadian IGF. We focused on four main topics. Again, this year is more about policy and advocacy on our end with a couple of new laws and a couple of discussions on, on what's going on. So was mostly focused on connectivity, digital devices, and, and accessibility. Then we had a regulation of uh, digital platforms. Then on the regulation and supervision of uh, artificial intelligence and the link with the internet ecosystem that is quite present here in Quebec and specifically in Montreal. And then also open digital governance, cybersecurity, and still the focus on the data governance and data privacy and data use by outside companies. What's the main point coming up? One of the main points, actually, the report was last month, so the report will be published in the coming weeks, officially. And what came out of the, the IGF, the main results is the need and the idea to create a multi-stakeholder platform to engage in such uh, problems. So that's what partners and, and uh, people present at the IGF did agree on. That should be the next point with the creation of this platform early during the spring next year. I'll stop here to, to leave other uh, chapters of speak. Yep. Thank you, Pierre Jean. It's great to see and congratulations on ISOC uh, Quebec and as the convener for the Quebec IGF. I think that's a, a great initiative and I wish you success in the future of that and as you strengthen and kind of level that up. So great job there. Well, one thing I forgot to mention is also we're trying to focus on young and, and, and youth. Uh, and we're also discussing a couple of partners to launch an uh, ambassador program at the level of the province that would be able to have regular delegations to attend international events financed by a couple of partners. So that's a way to engage more youth people within the internet ecosystem as we feel that there are some different preoccupations for these people and we want to integrate that in the larger ecosystem of the province. That's it. Excellent. Now. Excellent. Thank you very much. And thank you once again, ISOC Quebec. ISOC DC chapter, Chelsea, please welcome. It is very exciting to be here. As some of you may know, we have uh, done a recent uh, election. So we have a caretaker council that's currently in place. All seven of us, I believe, are going to be new. 
Uh, we are a caretaker council and we're going to be carrying the chapter forward into the new year where we're going to have a new election and we're going to move on from there. Then the second piece of news I have is that we will be again partnering with the Internet Education Foundation to webcast the State of the Net, which is on February 12th. Uh, and then our third item is that we, the next day on February 13th, in order to maximize uh, the possibility of seeing some of you, uh, we're going to be holding a hybrid AGM meeting. And we're also working on uh, including guest speakers, having a panel to do in tandem with our AGM meeting on the 13th. And lastly, and one of the things we're very excited about is that we have plans underway to organize and get IGF USA rolling again uh, mid-year. So that's us from ISOC DC. We're building and we're restructuring and we're looking forward to a strong 2024. Thank you for that, Chelsea. And fingers crossed everything is working out well. And welcome all the new council members from the DC chapter. The North American community is, is quite a wide geographic area, but it's a very tightly knit community. So we look forward to helping you all out. So welcome. Mike Snell from the Interplanetary Networking Chapter, I believe is present. Um, yes, I Mike, am. Would you like to give a couple of words and then I can play the video for our uh, sure. audience? Sure. So the Interplanetary Chapter is also known as IPN SIG because for about 20 years, we were the Interplanetary Networking Special Interest Group of the Internet Society, and the global technical community probably knows us better as IPN SIG than as the interplanetary chapter. We've had a pretty busy year, and so our chairman, Kaneko-san, who lives and works in Tokyo, and this me meeting started at 4 a.m., so he's not attending, but he did make a video highlighting our activities over the past year. And then I'll talk a little bit about what we're going to be focusing on in the next calendar year. So go ahead and start the video. So hello, who's out there uh, on this call? My name is Yosuke Kaneko, and I'm the current chair of the Interplanetary Chapter. Today, uh, I would like to uh, take a moment uh, to share uh, some of our progress made uh, this year at our chapter 2023 was actually a tremendous year for us, and uh, our membership were extremely active. We just hit uh, 1,000 members last month, and we've published a report on the interplanetary internet, uh, which is mostly the part of my talk today. Uh, we've hosted uh, nearly 10 webinars this year at the IPNC Academy. We've also crafted a video on the interplanetary internet and uh, we've also promoted uh, many projects to uh, demonstrate uh, the bundle protocol uh, for future uh, use in the interplanetary internet. So there's so much to talk about, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to pick one of them today, uh, which is about the report that was uh, published in September. Before I start talking about this, I actually work at the, the Japanese space agency, which is called JAXA, for my normal job. So I want to start by giving you an overall context in space exploration and where we're at right now. As we all know, the Apollo uh, landed on the moon in 1969. And after 50 some years from that, there is a great interest in the moon again. Unlike the uh, Apollo days, this time the goal is to stay on the lunar surface for sustainable human activities on the moon. Once humans demonstrate how to live and work on the moon, humanity's next step is to extend its venture to Mars. So the Apollo landed times in the 1960s to the 1970s. As you can see, most of the missions landed in the equator zone. However, more interest is growing on the South Pole region, since scientists say that there is ice or water in that region. If humanity is successful in finding these resources, it could be possibly purified and could make it as drinkable water, or we can also break them down to hydrogen and oxygen, which can be used as rocket fuel, and those can be energy sources. If we find these resources there, it really kind of extends uh, humanity's ability to explore even farther into our solar system. This is a picture of how we envision the lunar surface in the end. 
we might have a habitat, solar panels, fuel plants, gateway. These are all the things and elements that we envisioned in the assist lunar domain. It really shows us that we really need a, a communication infrastructure to support all these activities. There are already several programs that have been set up by the space agencies, uh, such as NASA, uh, as LunaNet, and the, uh, the Moonlight program, uh, which is being promoted by the European Space Agency, uh, both of which are uh, programs uh, to set up a lunar com uh, infrastructure in the lunar domain. Japan uh, also has an architecture uh, concept uh, as well, and uh, we're currently conducting uh, many research and development on uh, optical communications. China also has uh, plans to deploy uh, several relay satellites around the moon and also at Lagrange points. Also, there's a growing interest uh, from the industry on the LunaNet as well. I guess there's like 100 companies listed here who has uh, shown interest in participating in this program. So these are the things that is really happening uh, in the space arena today. The picture that you see here right now is what the interplanetary chapter envisions in the end, which we call the solar system internet. This is an interplanetary network backbone that connects Earth assets and the moon assets and the Mars assets through a, a network backbone serving for multiple purposes. The interplanetary chapter really envisions that we should endeavor to realize this solar system internet as a common structure, because in the end, it all becomes a benefit for humanity. Having a common structure like the terrestrial internet uh, would lead to sustainable and resilient uh, human and robotic activity. Not just that, it also promotes new discoveries in science and in innovation and in growth of economy and so on. So there's a lot of good things that come together through that vision. <clears throat> The question is, could we achieve a common and shared network even in space? We've seen that there's a lot of uh, programs and initiatives from the government and space agencies and private sectors. So the real question is, could we achieve this as a common structure in the end? This is my uh, personal uh, reflection, uh, but to me, the current situation in space com is kind of analogous uh, to the old days of the internet where the different types of networks, the ARPANET and SATNET and PRNET, they all started to interconnect with each other uh, using TCP IP. That was in 1983. And I see it as in the not too distant future that uh, we will also see these kind of interconnections of different networks in space as well. So the Interplanetary Network Special Interest Group uh, or the Interplanetary Chapter, we really kind of tackle this question of how could we realize a common SSI? We started by saying that uh, let's go ahead and inherit the good lessons from the internet. There are several things that we can uh, learn and inherit from the internet model, uh, such as uh, introducing a common way of doing things, uh, such as uh, establishing a standard like the TCP IP or the BGP, of course, we should have open forums to refine the technology and also to have a multi-stakeholder discussion platform. And then hierarchical management of uh, critical resources. These could be frequencies or numbering identifiers. So these are things that we can learn from the internet structure. And of course, the multi-stakeholder policy making process. So these are the things that we kind of laid out through this study process. And the interplanetary chapter had released a report on this, this September. It actually touches on various dimensions, including how space law and treaties could effectuate in the governance regime, or what are the recommended governance practices and how the existing organizations could play a role in order to achieve a common solar system internet. It is uh, downloadable uh, from our website, ipnsig.org, or you can quickly scan the QR code on the far right-hand side. So please check them out, and uh, we appreciate any feedback from you. I think that's all I have to say for today. I really missed this call, but I'm really privileged to make this briefing and presentation to the call. So thank you very much for having me today, and good luck on the meeting. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Yoski, for that. Mike, back to you. Okay. So just some overarching stuff because people may not be familiar with interplanetary networking. It's all about distance. Here on planet Earth with 186,000 miles per second, 300,000 meters per second, there's basically instantaneous connection. And that's a, a basic architectural assumption of TCP IP. TCP IP breaks after about four seconds of delay. And the minimum round trip time between Earth and Mars is about eight minutes. And the maximum is, I think, about 42 minutes. So it obviously doesn't work for these large distances and the delay and disruption involved in uh, data communications over those distances. So some other basic architecture had to be adopted. And that was started in about 1998 by Vint Cerf and the late Adrian Hook, who was a technical director at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And they're taking advantage of local storage to store what's called a bundle, the analog to a packet, until they get confirmation from the equivalent of the next top router that they've received the message. Since these bundles can be up to four gigabytes in size, you can send very large amounts of data over very large distances. There actually is a video developed by our vice president, Scott Burley, who actually wrote most of the code for the ION implementation of DTN, which is used by NASA for all communications to the International Space Station and will be used by both NASA and the European Space Agency for all lunar communications. And I will put that in the, uh, the link to that video in the chat. It gives a 25-year history of the technical development of DTN. But we have uh, kind of shifted our emphasis from technical issues because that battle's mostly won. The Consultative Committee for Space Data Systems, which is the global standard-setting organization for civilian spaceflight, has already adopted most of the bundle protocols. And IETF has a DTN working group that is cranking out formal standards for DTN. And so our emphasis for the last couple of years has made a shift towards governance because we believe that the time is now to start identifying all the appropriate stakeholders, starting the conversations to get agreements around a basic framework for the governance and regulation of the solar system internet. And that's what Kaneko-san was talking about primarily in his presentation. So for the next year, we're going to continue that emphasis in IPN SIG Academy. We are also going to be developing an online course, kind of a DTN 101 that is focused upon high school and college students. We will also start a space business working group to start providing a platform for highlighting small space businesses and creating opportunities for serendipitous collaboration amongst those space businesses. We actually have several space businesses that are members of IPN SIG. And so we're going to start there, but start reaching out. We've established some initial communications with Blue Origin. But we really think the environment is riper for small space businesses. We'll provide a couple of links. One is a link to the video that Kaneko-san referred to, which was developed by our member, Juan Ferreira, that gives an overview of the solar system internet and how we see it evolving over the next 100 years. And then again, that uh, retrospective look back at the technical development of the bundle protocol and DTN. So that's it. I really enjoyed participating in this call. It was great to hear what SF Bay ISOC is up to. Actually, IPN STIG is a result of a project of SF Bay ISOC that was launched in 2011. So that's it. I'll turn it back to you, Kyle. 
Thank you, Mike, for that. And Kaneko-san, thank you for your video. We've kind of gone over time now, but uh, I just wanted to reflect on just all the blood, sweat, and tears that you all put into the chapters. You're, it's all volunteer work. So whatever you put in is what you kind of take out. So it, it's amazing to see that you guys are very passionate about carrying the iStock torch forward and you help uh, make it a, a great place and a great organization for, for everyone in, in that continued uh, positive uh, trajectory. It's an honor to serve you all and, and uh, work and manage the, uh, the North American region. And I think it's been a very fruitful and successful year. So you can all pat yourselves on the back for that. And we all look forward to, to working with you and uh, collaborating with you and cross collaboration between chapters uh, in the future. So with that, I'd like to end the call and wish everyone a happy rest of 2023 and look forward to 2024.